When Prince Albert of England died in 1861, his wife, Queen Victoria, lived the rest of her life publicly mourning his passing. She would remain in this state for 40 years, donning black each morning up until her death in 1901. The Queen's dedication to her deceased husband sparked a large change in the social attitude towards death and saw the implementation of many mourning rituals that we still partake in to this day. And, of course, like everything the Queen did in the Victorian era, the people were expected to replicate it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Historidame, and today we're discussing the depressing life of a Victorian widow. Death is inevitable. We all die, and though we are living longer lives due to modern medicine, death is still as inevitable for us as it was for the Victorians. In the Victorian era, however, death was a more commonplace reality. Lack of medical knowledge and treatments for common diseases meant that people died more often and at a younger age. Knowing how to properly prepare for the loss of a friend or family member and acting accordingly was expected, particularly in the upper classes. There were many rules when it came to mourning the deceased properly and not being properly mourned by those you left behind could be considered a fate worse than death. These included having a lavish and expensive funeral, dressing in the appropriate attire, and altering your social behavior depending on your relationship to the deceased. Since many adults did not live past their 50s, funerals were planned well in advance. It was not uncommon for families to collect black clothing, order wood for their coffin, and start saving for years in order to pay for the funeral. The determination to have a decent burial for a family member was incredibly important, even if it meant that the surviving family members would suffer financially. To have a meager funeral, or a pauper's grave, was considered the ultimate disgrace which meant that the case was often, Sorry, little Timmy, we don't have money for food today because Grandpa needs the fancy tombstone. Superstition was also very common, so when a family member did pass away, there were many customs that the surviving family would have to adhere to. This included tasks like covering mirrors, stopping clocks in order to prevent bad luck, closing the eyes of the deceased, and taking the corpse out of the house feet first, in the belief that if they faced backwards, they might cause the death of another family member. Much like weddings today, funerals were a large affair and had invitations sent out, though certain people such as pregnant women or the wife of a deceased husband would be considered exempt from attending. Before the corpse was removed for the funeral, it was not uncommon for the surviving family members to either take photos of or with the body. Since photography was very expensive for the average family, many people only took photographs at big life events, such as weddings or funerals. Many times, poorer families might not even have a photograph of their deceased relative, so taking a photo of the body would provide them with a visual reminder of their loved one. This practice, known as Victorian death photography, was very common, especially with children since they had the highest mortality rate. And while it was a nice sentiment, these results could be incredibly disturbing. I mean, just look at this. It was also during the Victorian era that the practice of sending flowers to the bereaved family became popular. This was before embalming was commonplace, so while making funeral arrangements and awaiting the photographer, flowers could mask the smell of a body. Like the devastated Queen Victoria, in order to mourn properly, the Victorians would engage in a public display of their grief. This would differ in length depending on their relationship to the deceased, with the responsibility largely falling to the women of the family, specifically the wives. A widow was expected to be in mourning for her husband for a minimum of two years, while a child mourning a parent or the other way around would only mourn for one year. Once again, kids died a lot. Grandparents and siblings would be mourned for six months, aunts and uncles two months, and cousins four weeks. The primary way of displaying your state of grief would be through your wardrobe. For men, this was easy. They would simply wear their usual dark suits along with other black accessories, such as gloves, hatbands, or cravats. Adult women, specifically widows, would have the most restrictions when it came to clothing and behavior. When a husband died, this was the longest time that a woman would spend in mourning. This period was divided into different stages, deep mourning, full mourning, and half mourning each which had their own rules to follow. 
The first stage of mourning occurred directly after the death, called deep mourning. Deep mourning lasted for about three months, and during this time, a widow would wear a mourning veil to cover her face. This was also known as a weeping veil, since she could cry without being noticed while her face was covered. After the initial three months, the widow would then go into full mourning, an extreme social display of grief that would last up to two years. When in full mourning, it was important that a widow maintained a certain wardrobe. Your husband might be dead, but that doesn't mean you should stop dressing in style. The bad news is, this means only wearing dull and lusterless fabrics in the deepest of black, such as crepe, a hard and scratchy silk. Crepe was specifically associated with mourning because it is a fabric that cannot be combined with any embellishments, such as embroidery, satin, or lace, making it a more modest and appropriate choice when coping with the loss of a relative. Jewelry of any kind was also forbidden during the first few months of mourning. Eventually, a widow could don simple black jewelry like pearls, or various mementos such as lockets, brooches, and rings, usually containing a lock of hair and a photograph of the deceased. Locks of hair in general were considered sentimental keepsakes of a loved one. It was not uncommon for a wreath or even jewelry to be made from human hair. Queen Victoria herself was known to wear a locket with a piece of the late Prince Albert's hair inside. Once a widow had been in mourning for the minimum allotted time, she could move into half mourning, which gave her more options for clothing. This transition was gradual, happening over several months and would last for an additional year, though some women chose to stay in this state for the rest of their lives. During half mourning, a widow would still wear her mementos and black pearls, but she could now add gold, silver, or precious gems into the jewelry set and wear black clothing trimmed in grey, lavender, mauve, or white. Of course, following all the rules of fashion for a widow was a very expensive endeavour. Victorian women of less financial means might borrow black clothing from a friend, or dye an existing dress. This meant that the strict rules of mourning dress mostly applied to those who could afford it, though it was expected that an effort was made if you could. Aside from fashion, there were also many rules surrounding social behavior when experiencing the loss of a close family member. Widows in full mourning were required to undergo strict social isolation. They were not allowed to leave the house for business, social, or leisurely activities, nor could they receive visitors. Parties and social events were also completely barred to a widow, as attending any such gathering would result in extreme disapproval from the rest of her social circle. The one exception to this rule, however, was attending church. This may seem rather cruel by today's standards, since it's now common to receive the support of loved ones when grieving. But in the Victorian era, a woman was expected to weather this time in isolation, since it was believed that her grief would be unbearable. It does make one wonder, however, if widows were really that broken up over their husband's death, or had just fallen into a deep depression from two years of complete social isolation. A man who had lost his wife, on the other hand, was exempt from these rules, since it was believed that it would interfere with his ability to partake in society. A double standard that is just baffling! In the unfortunate event that a second relative died during a widow's time of mourning, the socially acceptable grieving period of the new relative would be added on to the current time she was serving. After a widow transitioned into half-mourning, she could slowly re-enter society, though at a distance. In order to signal this change to friends and family, black-edged cards and invitations would be sent out, informing people that she was ready to once more receive visitors. After a minimum of two years spent in mourning, a widow could finally begin the transition back into a normal life. Though of course, like Queen Victoria, some would choose to remain in this state for years afterwards. If her husband had been wealthy, a widow was lucky because she could live in relative comfort without the urgency of finding another husband. As was the case for most widows, however, they needed some means of supporting themselves. Some might find jobs, but a working woman was a rare thing during the Victorian era. This burden usually fell to the poor and desperate. Many widows ended up remarrying in order to support themselves and their children, though they had to be careful how they approached the task, since doing so too soon could result in social ridicule. Luckily for her, a veiled woman in black was actually considered very attractive at the time, so she usually had her options open. 
as long as she prayed that this husband didn't die as well and start the process all over again. Hey everyone, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or a comment down below. If you want to see more content like this, you can also subscribe to my channel and keep up to date on all the fun history videos of the future. But for now, I bid you farewell.